And besides, everything I do is cartooning in one form or another. I'm a cartoonist because rather than drawing the world that my eyes see, I draw the world that my mind concocts. I'm not interested in drawing things as they seem to appear. My goal when I sit down to draw is the same as it was when I was four years old. I found the world frightening and confusing then, and I find it just as frightening and confusing now. I like that, and I want to draw it. I decided at an early age that I would forego the usual channels in which people generally find outlets for their energies and ambitions, and to devote myself to attempting to express my thoughts about the hidden world. And to the extent that I have a knack for this kind of work, I'm sometimes qualified to perform highly specialized and delicate work such as this visual aid here, which was done, was commissioned by a mental health professional to depict the mechanism by which some schizophrenics induce psychotic episodes in themselves because they like them. More often than not, my goal when I draw a picture is to show alternative versions of everyday experiences, as in this picture here, which is called Playdate, and which addresses the very serious problem of genteel alcoholism, especially in the afternoon. Now, I know that I'm far from the only person to have seen apparitions and to have had hallucinations. Many other normal people have had similar experiences, especially when they were young. But for most of these people, these neurological misfires are of no particular value. They contribute nothing worthwhile to their lives, and they are best transcended and forgotten. But I cherish them, and I want to keep them coming, because for me, they represent the ground of true meaning in life and the basis of all my work. And so I've worked hard to keep these experiences fresh in my consciousness and to keep the process going. I've worked hard to keep seeing down that long corridor, through that endless stream of rooms, through to the beginning of this journey. The physicist Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington expressed my sentiments exactly in his much scoffed at work, Fundamental Theory, when he wrote, quote, it seems to me that the first step in a broader revelation to man must be the awakening of image building in connection with the higher faculties of his nature so that these are no longer blind alleys, but open out into a spiritual world. A world partly of illusion, no doubt, but in which he lives no less than the world also of illusion, revealed by the senses. I should probably start this self-promotional puff piece with uh, some drawings from my childhood, but I destroyed them all when I was very young, or at least I thought I had. It turned out that some of them survived, and my brother came across some of them when he was cleaning out the ancestral home after my father died. In that package was this picture here, which I made when I was four or five years old. It's a drawing of a hideous little man made of electricity who used to come into my bedroom at night <laughs> and jabber at me and terrify me. And he most scared me by calling his name out over and over and over and over again, his name was Jiggity Jatters, the worst name. I just about had a coronary when I saw this one. Looking at it again rekindled vivid memories of the disorienting hell that my earliest years were. There was something not quite right with my mind. Almost every time I closed my eyes, I saw something. Almost, uh, almost every time. Sometimes it was a scary face that would not go away. Frequently it was a huge staring eye. Sometimes it was headless animals. And sometimes it was beautiful, brightly colored, lathe turned looking radially symmetrical objects that hovered in the air over my bed. When I first heard about angels, I thought that these things were what was being referred to. And I innocently tormented my parents by asking them over and over again what they were until they finally with they finally persuaded me with tears and hysteria to stop talking about them. Lucky that I was born in 1952, because if I'd been born in 1982 or thereabouts, my 
teachers and parents would have put me on Ritalin for sure, and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to enjoy my, uh, my psychotic little dream world. As it is, I was simply a problem child, and I drove my parents nuts. But I emerged from it all as sane as a saint. I learned not only to accept being frightened, but to enjoy it, and to enjoy almost any unexpected and bizarre situation. I even learned to enjoy extreme fear. For over a year, I went to bed certain that my parents were about to come into the room and kill me. It was sheer paranoia, and I liked it. I might have come to grips with all of this in a perfectly organic way, except for a chance encounter that I had with an artistic document which rang a bell in my mind so loud that it still reverberates. I was about four or five when I encountered this, and this document became my prime motivator. It was the foundation of my life's path and the basis of all my creative output. Copies of this life-altering manifesto still survive, and I have it here for you to look at. The sound might not be that it all should be, so you may have to strain your ears to hear it. I hope not. I hope this, the acoustics of this room will carry the day. Uh, this is suitable for all ages, but I should warn you that it is metaphysically intense and rather disturbing. Thank <laughs> you. 
impression on me is a extreme understatement. It affected me so strongly that I really can't overemphasize it. I had watched it so carefully and I had memorized it so completely that I would lie in bed at night playing it over and over again in my mind and like that game of telephone where the message gets distorted each time it's repeated. Every time I reimagined it and remembered it, it would become distorted until at the end of a few weeks, it had become this great, sprawling mythos of metaphysical mayhem and moralizing. My problem was that I thought that it was real, that these events were happening somewhere in my neighborhood, and I was desperate to go and find out where all this was going on. I became known as the boy who looked into everything. When my parents would take me to somebody else's house. The first thing I would do if I could get away with it would be to immediately go and look behind their drapes. Consequently, I've missed a lot of things which have really been going on. But I, I wanted so much to find those rooms, that bicycle, the, that pool, Betty, that I just, uh, it became an obsession. And I, I pretty much locked everything else outside of my life. It gave me an abiding sense that there is a larger and more wor real world hiding behind this one. And that world is what I've always wanted to draw. I drew constantly when I was a teenager, but I wasn't really very good. And once again, I destroyed all the drawings that I did at that age, except for a few that were in that package that my brother found and sent to me. I probably did this when I was 17 years old. As you can see, I was a prodigy. That word ink hand scrawled across it, as well as the drips and scribbles are characteristic of everything I did at that time. Every drawing I did ended up just splattered and ruined with the word ink hand scrawled across it because an ink hand is what I wanted to have. An ink hand is my, my, my uh, mantra for the ability to use the pen and ink fluidly, and I just couldn't do it. But I found out that the wonderful thing about the personality of the born cartoonist is that you can do work that you know in your heart is substandard, but which you think is more beautiful and magnificent than anything else anybody has ever done. When I was in high school, I knew exactly one other person who shared this delusional survival mechanism. His name was John Dorman. That's him with our childhood heroes, Gene Moss and Jim Thurman, who are a Los Angeles comedy writing team. He was uh, the greatest 
natural cartoonist that I've ever known. He worked for the animation studio, so nobody has ever seen his work. We became good friends, and we spent our evenings after school working on comics. Some of which were published in this lamentable hippie tabloid called Two Big Comics, which was sold in beat-up vending machines on Hollywood Boulevard. This is a comic that I did from those days. As you can see, I was drenched in melancholy. Uh, in fact, I was so drenched in melancholy that it kind of put me into a state of suspended animation. I would leave the house and go for walks that lasted for two or three hours, during which I, I walked so slowly that I only covered about half a block of sidewalk. And more than once, the police were called because somebody looked out their window and saw me moving very, very slowly down the sidewalk in front of their house. It was a Actually, not a bad time in my life. I, I had what I called sticky moods, gray, gloomy moods that were not unlike ecstasies. And if I only had the savoir faire at the time, I think I could have cultivated them into something really significant. Right after high school, I went to Glendale Junior College, where I did not do very well because I was so scramble headed, but I did have a pivotal incident there, and I guess this is anecdote number two of the triangulation of anecdotes which characterized me. I took a class in art history which uh, started out with a spread on Asian architecture. And after looking at all these slides of Egyptian, Abyssinian, and uh, Persepolitan ruins, the screen went white, and the hair in the back of my neck stood up. I knew something was going to happen, and then I had the most powerful and long-affecting hallucination I've ever had in my life, which was this frog, which shot up from the bottom of the white screen and settled down into this pose and extended that one eye skyward. My reaction to that was to scream and tip my chair over backwards and gouge the leg of the woman behind me, and while everybody was attending to her, I ran out of there. I determined I would never go to school again. I went home, and I started drawing this frog over and over and over again. I drew it compulsively. I drew it in different ways. I tried desperately to uncover the mysteries that were behind this thing. And uh, I still draw it even today when I'm feeling sort of alone in the world. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a totem animal or a spirit guide or what. But it means a great deal to me and I'm in love with this creature. There was a little company named Cardboard Rocket Ship that made a sort of a little sculpture of it that didn't come out too good. That's that. At any rate, having decided that the sacred groves of academe were not for me, I uh, got a job as a garbage man and lived in this shack, which is depicted in this cartoon. And I devoted myself to trying to learn how to draw, to ingesting whiskey and prosthetic spiritual aids, and uh, generally indulging in a life of uh, mayhem that I'm still living down. Um, the main thing I did during those days was I tried to learn how to draw. This is the first picture I ever did that actually achieved what I wanted it to do. I was 26 when I did it, and uh, it's not a great picture by a long chalk, but it was a huge breakthrough for me. I realized that I had acquired the ability to use the vocabulary, which uh, I knew was working inside me in order to express the things that were important to me. And uh, I decided that I needed a vehicle to express myself. It took me a long time to actually come up with the formula. It wasn't until 1980 that I was able to actually put out this stupid little 16-page Xerox auto journal called Jim, in which I used words and pictures to uh, express my feelings and beliefs about things. It had ads in the back for things like the fortune-telling stink bug, and the uh, gym mask and erotic drawings and lemon juice, which I'm sure are a serious disappointment to anybody who bought them. You can see at the top of the column there, there's a big green amphibian watercolor that I offered for sale. About this time, I got married, and I uh, realized that I wasn't capable of earning any kind of a living doing what I had been doing. And so uh, my old friend John, seen earlier, got me a job at Ruby Spears, which was the company responsible for Turbo Team, the Mr. T Show, Rubik's the Amazing Cube, and other abominations. It was a terrible, they made absolutely terrible cartoons, but the working situation there was fantastic. Jack Kirby worked there, of all people. 
he uh, drew this horse, Prince Valiant's horse, which when he did had such a nasty, insinuating expression that we made of our mascot. We called it a widow <laughs> And uh, there's a picture of Jack. Was, uh, during one of his many visits to the office, he was uh, a wonderful man and a lot of fun to have around. I wasn't a comic book hero, so I didn't appreciate, I mean, a comic book, uh, comic book hero. I wasn't a comic book fan, so I didn't realize what a uh, hero he was. He did a lot of uh, presentation art and concept art for the studio. He thought that there would eventually be a show based on his ideas, but there never was. And as time went on and none of his ideas were taken seriously, his ideas got loopier and loopier and loopier until towards the end of his tenure he was just handing in these purely psychotic images which had no chance of going anywhere but nevertheless it was my job to ink them in and color them and they were used to keep the interest of the networks alive in this pitiful animation studio. Uh, he did a lot of concepts and prop and scenic and character arts in the studio with a wash in his drawings. I never actually took any of them because I was uh, against stealing in those days, but I did take a, I did rescue this drawing from a trash can and some drawings that Jack did of Doberman for the Mr. T show. I learned something very important about myself by working at Ruby Spears. I learned that I'm not a team player. I don't like to take orders, I don't want to be a member, and I really don't like trying to bring somebody else's vision to life. Another famous cartoonist who worked in that studio was Gil Kane. He and I became good friends. He was also good friends with Gary Groff, the owner of Fanographics Books. Gil introduced me to Gary, and Gary saw a copy of Jim, and he said, you know, if you put comics in that, I'll publish them. So I put some comics into the material I had already drawn, and he published. Jim Magazine, the first one came out in 1986, and it was the lowest selling magazine on the Fanographics roster for years, but Fanographics kept publishing it even though they lost money on it, for which I'm indebted, and, uh, and is the reason I'll always be loyal to Fanographics. Jim gave me an opportunity to express a lot of ideas that were not really easy to express. And some of them, the uh, ideas were buried so deep it was hard to shine a light on them. And sometimes they were so pathetically and transparently Freudian that I wondered how I had the nerve to put them into print. This is one of my all-time favorite stories from the 90s. It's uh, called The Hindu Marriage Game, and it's got music by my friend Bill Frizzell. Go for it. And you know, this is actually a long presentation and I've only got a little bit of time. There's something I want to show you, so I'm just going to fast forward through all these images. That was kind of graphic. First, I'm trying to find out. I'll find out. Man, Hodges, man, Hodges. Three times. Stop trying to first find out. He's a revolving man. Here's how Frank gets out of the unifactor. There's Mark Martin starts to cover the panel of stories. You can also prank in the river, showing how bloody those comics could be. You can the prank book, it's drawn from Grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> this is drawing the worst, worst number thing I did with Bill. Well, for Zell, we did this multimedia stage show called Mysterious and Panico. Uh, this drawing did based on the drawing found a long time ago. I can't remember where it came from. This is the kind of picture I like to draw, which shows the moment just before things go irredeemably to hell. This is a picture I did after I saw a bunch of Sally and Dim and Norm and saw the reality looks like with the tablecloth flipped off the top of it. Uh, this is a uh, philosophical representation of how I survived, which is to uh, overcome the insecurity of my life by pretending I'm camping. <laughs> uh, this is a question of how it is I get five people ask me how I make a living, and I say, I really don't know. It's just the hand of providence that sustains me. This is a painting that is intended to express the idea that knowledge extinguishes the flame of curiosity. This is a video of me, which I will fast forward past. The drawing called The Artist's Eyes from a series of things I'm doing called The Case Against Art. Um, there's another drawing called The Case Against Art. I really don't have the time to get into all, into all this. It's really interesting. I'm just going to zip right past it. This is a picture called Jesus and the Bear. Typically, <laughs> <laughs> it's a rebuttal to Mel Gibson's snuff film. I wanted to show Jesus to take a piece and smile. The bear is attacking, who just got up in the hills to meditate. And 
before you feel Jesus brings you bear to a state of super consciousness, you see them here, master and disciple in a state of shared spiritual communion. <laughs> now, this is a drawing by Ralph Barton from the New Yorker, which terrified me. These are drawings by Morris Arthur Bashik, which is really love. You're regarding the rhythm and the life, which everybody knows. Here's a song of love by Giorgio de Carico, which I saw at a huge exhibition of surrealism and Donna at the other County Art Museum. This is an Archon Ted Comics cover, everybody knows that. This is a, draw, a sculpture by Stanislaw Shikolsky, a wild man of whom I'm particularly enamored. And now here's what I was trying to get to in this headline rush. My all-time favorite comic, The Wiggle Bunch. Yes, you may have seen this in Dan Dell's great book, Art Out of Time. The Wiggle Bunch by Herbert Crowley. I'm going to give you a dramatic reading of it because even though I think you can read it, I love to read it. Remember, this is a children's comic from the newspaper in 1909. Oh, William Beak, here comes another for the menagerie. In the menagerie, indeed. Christopher Keene, you must be in your dotage. Away with him to the chamber of awakening. Have you forgotten, then, the signs of magic sleep? Flow fragrant waters distilled from the rose, fresh as a dewdrop which cooleth the nose. Return power of sight from mysterious sleep, for the failures around us lie dismally deep. Light from the sky descend in full glare through crystal lenses of purity rare, directed by reason and cunning of man into the eyeball through a tin can. Mysteries of movement and joyous brought by sound that bring forth sweet smiles and good feelings profound. Drink of these charms, this joyousness rare, imparted to us by this happy pair. Smiling is really but life's happy side. The teachings of sorrow are also our guide. Kind feelings for others whom troubles pursue make nature complete. This has happened to you. <laughs> now that is educational. That is the kind of thing. I mean, it's just a pity that our kids uh, don't get that kind of stuff in the newspaper anymore. But I think we've about reached the end of our time. Am I right? Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. No, I never did. I had a, a thing about walls. I was always looking for the right wall, and uh, I never really did. And I used to hallucinate kind of regularly. I, they were just neurological misfires. They didn't mean anything. I've had three, I think, in the past six years. One was I was at the mall where I seldom go, and this woman, a neighbor saw me and walked up behind me and said, hey, Jim, and when I turned around, her head looked like someone had taken a balloon and covered it with glue and lint from the dryer and then popped the balloon so there was a lint shell and punched a hole in it with a big wad of chewing gum at the base of it. And that scared me considerably. And then a couple of years after that, I was looking out the kitchen window and I saw Thompson and Thompson from the tin can, that this real men, in black and white, walking down the street with like a nine foot hooker in fuchsia hot pants. And when I looked at the window to get a better look, it was a woman and her two small children walking down the street. And then about a year and a half ago, I was upstairs in my house and I went up to the second floor landing and I saw my reflection in a mirror at the end of the hall. And I thought, wait a minute, there's no mirror in there. There's a guy standing there. And there's a guy standing there wearing like khakis and a white shirt and had a leather harness over his head, which had was made of straps and it, the junctions and all the straps were leather circles with the number nine for because of them. And he was staring at me with these beseeching eyes and were terrific, staring like this, like a dead man standing. And that uh, lasted until I lost my focus and then it disappeared. But I haven't had one of those in a couple of years. I don't think they mean anything. I don't think they're visions. I don't think they're spiritual or anything like that. They're just my mind. But it's like dreaming when you're awake. Yes? The case against art? Well, 
Yeah, it's kind of a personal thing. I guess I don't recommend it for everybody, but uh, I, art has meant an inordinate amount to me during the case of my life. And like a lot of people, I have uh, sought spirituality in art. And I felt that I reached a point where I have to stop looking for art, for spirituality in the abstract through art, and just go directly to it. You know, abandon the train wheels and go right to the source. And so uh, that's what that's about. There's this also this big thing. I just there's a video about it that I didn't play about the age of cake, which is how I characterize the state of mind that I'm in now. It's past the age of eyes and past the age of egotism, the state of cake where you are aware of this corrosive death cake waiting for you at the end of the line, like Wallace Stevens's palm at the end of the mine. And um, that death cake has to be contended with because it's the ultimate reality. And so for me, that's a big spur to get off the dime and stop screwing around with um, the scintillating fun aspect of religion that comes from enjoying it through iconography and um, the fun of image making and get down to the hard work of heavy lifting and make it happen. Yes? Can uh, the frog explain this a little bit, but could you talk a little bit more about the prevalence of amphibian? Uh, thematically for you, and specifically interested in the idea that you're stuck between the two worlds? Well, yeah, that's it. Yeah, as little Lulu said, there's nothing prettier than a frog. Mm -hmm. I think most people are attracted to frogs, although I know some people have a terrifying pathological fear of them. You know, like you said, they're amphibious, they, they exist in both worlds, they seem to sit stock still as if they're meditating, and then they can move like grease lightning in a moment's notice, so they're not distracted. They're evidently tightly focused and you never catch them napping. And they're strangely anthropomorphic, too. It's odd how often, how much frogs look like human beings, considering how little they look like human beings. <laughs> <laughs> but they just fascinate me. I love, you know, most people like frogs. You see my Hallmark cards all the time. <laughs> my third anecdote? Oh, yeah, well, uh, I went to Los Angeles about two years ago, and I spent every dime I had on granola for the trip, and I lost my wallet. There was absolutely no money in it. And then the airline called me and they had found it and they mailed it back to me and somebody had put five bucks in it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. At the age of six, and then I, you were my favorite storyteller in books. And really? And now it's the one who were, uh, I was really glad to stand along with it. But um, yes. my question was, when you do your work, um, are you trying to focus on human nature or are you doing stories or open communication? What are you trying to convey when you I guess what I'm trying to convey in my work is the sense of fun that I get in contemplating how bizarre things are. Just that, I guess that's just it. Well, you're talking about metaphors, like are you trying to touch on human nature and politics or things? Or? No, not politics. Right. Not politics. Human nature, I don't really know what human nature is, but I know that... That's like psychology. Psychology, not even that. I, I, I guess what I, I, I think is that everybody has to contend with this world. There's lots of things about life that are beautiful and wonderful, but there's also lots of things that are terrifying. You know, you can look at nature and it's really sweet, and then you realize everything survives by eating something else, claws and teeth. They're actually quite nightmarish. They're like to die. Nobody even likes to wrestle with that. So life is this weird blend of uh, good and bad. People have different ways of contending with it, and uh, that generates a certain kind of energy that people have been trying to express with our work forever. You know, surrealists tried one approach, Hieronymus Bosch tried another approach, Landscape painters try another approach. People are always trying to wrestle with the transitory beauty and terror, terror of living, the horror of life, which everybody seems to enjoy in some level, like your own Poe. I mean, who knows? It's just something. Yes? Oh, yes. Um, also, I've been uh, following your work for uh, a long time. In fact, I got your number one uh, in 1987. Big Planet in Bethesda, so you got people about your stellar, but you were all over the country at that time. Um, I just, it seems like in the last two years or so, you've been, you came up with Weathercraft and then this new book, and it seems like uh, you're, you're, I mean, just because it was very hard to find work from you over the years for a while, it was few and far between, and then it seems like it's coming out more frequently, and um, is that just because you're, uh, you're, uh, you, you want to work more, or the publishers are asking you for more, it's easier for you? Or? 
No, I've always worked, but at the end of the 90s, I decided I'd done enough comics for a while, and I wanted to do some paintings and standalone drawings and just do that for a while. So I stopped doing comics and do the pictures. And then uh, the technology changed, and it became possible to get really good, high-quality printing. Everything was done with the computer. You could get nice, you could make nice bound books for very, very little. Publishers stopped saying, oh, we can't do that. It's too expensive. And people, you know, Chris Ware, people like that were pioneering this beautiful art object book, and it became possible to do that. But on this racket, I right, need to do a 100 page book in order to do it. So that, that was my motivation. And besides, I wanted to start drawing with a pen again. I, I like the pen. Yes? Just ask if you have a eye pattern. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you go into the Well, I used to see eyes a lot, you know, when I was a kid and I had those night terrors and everything. Eyes were always prevalent. I've always liked eyes. And, you know, it's a, it's a common thing. Eyes in things. You see it in surrealism and spooky pictures of all stripes. I think that we're all arrested by eyes. Yes. Yes, we are. Yes, sir. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, Giant Pen Project. Well, the Giant Pen Project. Uh, it's a giant pen that I made. The handle is 16 long and the nib is 16 inches long. I had the nib, I designed it, and I had a metal smith in Seattle build the blank and then had a jeweler cut the hole into it, very elaborate. And then I had a guy who engraved gun stock mechanisms engrave a pattern into it, and then I had the whole thing brass plated, and then I had brass reservoirs bolted to the underside of it. And it will make a line that's 30 feet long and it's fully charged to think. I was motivated to do it because during the mid-90s I was in London and I went to a shop owned by a man who was then very ancient named Philip Poole. And he had a shop that sold nothing but pen points and he sold them to pen and ink artists all over the world. And I had this pen holder at home that was big and obviously held a big pen but I didn't have a nib for it and so I asked him if he had any that would fit it and he said he did. He had nibs that were four inches long and I said, wow, are you selling? And he said, no, 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 they're very rare. I said, are there any that are bigger than that? And he gave me this kind of pitying look and said, you couldn't make any bigger than that, they wouldn't work. And I thought, well, no, the English is going to tell me. <laughs> I thought I could make a giant pen, and so uh, I meditated on that for a while, and I just immediately knew that if I had nicely placed it, if they would do the work of providing the surface tension needed to hold the volume of ink. And so I, uh, the opportunity came along. It was an early version of that Kickstarter thing that everybody's using now, and our organization raised the funds for me to build it, and so I built it, or I had it built. And I've drawn up a few times, and I've actually gotten so I can make pictures with it that look good. <laughs> Although it takes a long time to make this thing, and it's real slow, and it gives you a backache. <laughs> yes? You said something earlier about the relationship between intelligence or information, and also knowledge, actually, knowledge and curiosity. I'm wondering what you think of the relationship between the two. Oh, I think knowledge extinguishes the flame of curiosity. I think once you get the answer to something, or you think you have the answer, you stop thinking about it. That's why it's good to live in doubt forever. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what is it about comics specifically that uh, uh, keeps you from that? Well, you know, I've always been kind of directionless. And when Gary Groth offered me the opportunity to get comics published, I really had no other plans. And I thought, oh, this is good. I can do comics as well as anything else I can do, which is to say sort of half well. So I, I decided to do that. And then once I started doing it, I got used to it. I thought it was as good a way to tell stories and get my ideas across as anything else. And so uh, I just became used to it. I'm an opportunist, as well as cars. On, on the text of your book, and you can question the, uh, the last two weather crafts and the end, you provide some kind of guide and explanatory Word, is there like a balancing act between how much you want to tell the audience and the reader and then how much you want to read so that there's not so much knowledge that they're that it, that it's too clear that you're going to be done? Well, I guess there is a tipping point, but I don't know what it is. And since the books don't have any words on the spine or the dust on the cover, I thought it would be good to make it so that there's all kinds of words on the dust jacket. And some people have told me there's too much information there that they learned more about the story that they wanted to, but you know. Not my problem. <laughs> and it gives me a chance to do a little bit of creative writing. 
know it could never be published otherwise. It's sort of a self-indulgent outlet. We must be just about out of time, am I right? <laughs> okay, so let's let's go. What's what's next? Can you tell us anything about what you have planned? Well, I'm going to I'm writing another 100-page story. In that Congress of the Animals book, Frank left the Unifactor in change. And so uh, I'm doing a story now in which Frank is a peripheral character, so I don't have to worry about how to deal with that. The, 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 what happens in the story is that this character, Pupshaw, for reasons involving um, Frank's acquisitiveness and jealousy, um, returns to the situation she was in before she met Frank, and we get a glimpse of her previous life, and a sort of a, not a romance, but a sort of a love triangle emerges where Frank finds himself hopelessly outclassed by Pupshaw's prior sponsor, paramour, friend, whatever it was, and uh, it's like a, it's like this, that's the base of it. Frank uh, has a really hard time uh, dealing with the superior dude in Puff's life. So that's what that one's going to be about. Okay, so we're done, but let's begin. Thanks for coming.